and no weapon that's formed against us shall prosper. Note it's a proclamation. It won't work. There ain't nothing that you can do to fight what God has already ordained. No weapon shall prosper. It won't work. Good morning, Roberts. I'm glad to stand before you today. I'm standing here because when Reverend Danley was on vacation, I agreed to preach for him so that he could have a full week off, and then I reneged. I went back on my word, and we know that we must be people of our word, so I promised that at some point I would honor my obligation. And so I stand. I stand before you on this first Sunday of August, knowing in my heart and soul that what I'd like to see is a church full of people. I'd like to see the altar dressed in white, and I'd like to be fellowshipping with you in our ritual of communion, but that is not where we are. We are a little disappointed because life has gone a different way. And so we're going to talk a little today. I am keeping Reverend Danley's theme of more than. It started off as take another look. Take another look because there is more there. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we come before you today with thanksgiving. Lord, I'm thankful to have the activity of my limbs. I am thankful for everything that you've done for me. Now, as we seek to divide your word, Father, I ask that you would hide me behind the cross. Lord, allow me to die a death that allows your Holy Spirit to live in me, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart might be acceptable to you. For God, you are my strength and my redeemer. Amen. And so we enter into this story, this great and beloved story. It's been told in so many different ways that many of us even have the story skewed for my favorite telling, and I love the Bible and I love the Gospel of John, but when the Gospel of Aretha gets to this story, I really love it. Because Aretha had a way of setting this story up such that I felt like I was there. And for a moment today, I would like for you to come with me on a journey and kind of pretend like you're there, like you're there in Bethany. You can choose your character. You can be Lazarus in the tomb. You can be Mary or Martha. You can be part of the gathered throng, but come with me on this journey. For just a few moments, let us take time to consider that the words that we read are a, a living example to us, that they speak directly to our spirits and to our souls because if not, we would look at the story and get caught up in the glory and the ecstasy of that moment. And what is that moment? It's the moment when Jesus comes to the tomb and says, come out, because there's glory in that, there's victory in that who, which one of us, does not want to experience, to be a part of that. Oh, but there's more. Yes, there's power over death, but there's more. Yes, there is the fact that Jesus wept, and we all know that verse, but there is still more. Yes, there's the fact that Jesus delayed his time coming to Bethany and that it seemed like the blessing would be denied. We could get caught there, but there is yet more. What is that more? Well, Roberts, I come to you today as one of you. 
There's more for me and you because if you take a moment to step back and look at this passage again, we will see that Jesus has very clearly explained to us that the salvation message, that the salvation story has as much to do with the gathered throng as it does with Lazarus. I mean, we're happy that Lazarus was raised up. That's our shouting moment. But if we get caught in the shout, we may miss the instruction. And so let's start at the beginning. Before what Reverend Danley read, there is a moment where Martha meets Jesus and Jesus and Martha have a discussion. And in that discussion, she confesses that Jesus is Lord and Jesus promises her that your brother will not remain dead. She confesses you are the resurrection. And so we already have the establishment of relationship. We understand how Martha views Jesus and how Jesus has viewed the situation. Yes, this is the story for many of us. We meet Jesus on a road and Jesus tells us what he's going to do for us, that he is going to redeem us, that he is going to sanctify us. And we are oh so glad. And we run and we go get sister or brother. And so Martha runs and gets Mary and Mary comes and Mary falls at Jesus' feet. And what does Mary do? Mary is in a position that many of us are in. I don't know if you've ever lost somebody. Certainly during this COVID time, I think that many of us can feel this pain. Jesus, if you had a been here, Aretha says it, my brother wouldn't have died. Jesus, if you had only come when we called you, my brother wouldn't have died. Jesus, if you had had them working on this vaccine when they initially had the money for it, we would not be seeing these thousands and thousands of deaths. Jesus, if the cancer cure was already there, we would not be seeing these kinds of deaths. Jesus, if you had been in the streets, the bullets wouldn't have hit my baby, we know we've fallen there before. My Lord. And Mary falls at his feet, and what's beautiful about it is that she's not chastised. See, too many of us are caught up in the misbelief that we can't take our true selves to Jesus, that we can't fall at Jesus' feet disappointed. We can't fall there broken. We can't say these things. Jesus just takes He just takes it. And this is where the story gets good. Because Jesus has a moving in his spirit and he says to her, hey, show me where you've laid him. Aretha says, show me where you laid him down. You see, people of God, Lazarus is dead. Mary has brought her pain and her affliction to the feet of Jesus, and many of us do the same thing, but we're so caught in our pity party that we forget to listen to the next directive. We come to this altar and we kneel down and we cry out, but we don't stay and tarry and listen. And Jesus said, show me where you laid him. Uh Said, I got something for that situation. You see, if Mary hadn't listened in that moment, would we have gotten to the place where Lazarus was called out? People of God, you have to understand what's happening in this message because Jesus is setting a mandate before the church that when you are afflicted, when you are burdened, when you are cast down, when you look out into the world and you see the wretched misery, you are to show Jesus where it's at. You're supposed to pick him up and take him there. No, you're not just supposed to look at what's happening in government and say nothing. You're not supposed to look at drug addiction, at homelessness, at violence, at evilness. And do nothing. Jesus said, show me where you laid it. Because see, in the tomb of death are all of those things. And we as the people of God are being told by God, take me to where it is. When was the last time that you took God into the situation? Or you still at the altar? 
I'm not saying that falling at Jesus' feet is a bad thing. It's not an indictment. However, you must listen. There's always a directive after us. Show me where you laid him. Show me where he is. And so they get up and they go. And they take Jesus to the tomb. The tomb where Lazarus has laid for four days. And I imagine for at least three nights. And Jesus says, take the stone away. Are you listening, people of God? These are directives to the community of faith, the gathered throng. You see, because before Jesus got there, the mourners had already started coming. And some of you all understand what I'm saying. You go through struggles and you go through tragedies and people are just coming from every which way. They're crying with you and they're mourning with you, but they are doing nothing. And Jesus said, but there is work yet for you to do. This Christianity thing is not a spectator's sport. So when we come back to Roberts, when we're back in the sanctuary, if the only place you find yourself is a pew, you know you did not listen when you fell at his feet. And so Jesus says, take the stone away. What are we saying? Take the stone away. Allow my light to shine in to that dark place. Allow my light to cast its gleaming brightness into the dark, dank, and stinky place where Lazarus lays. Now, Martha, my girl, a lot like me, she didn't already said, Lord, you, you are Lord. Yes, you are the resurrection. I hear you. It is to her that God made the promise. She's the very one that begins to question him. How often is that our response? God has already told you what he's going to do for you. The man said, God will do exactly what he said he would do. So no weapon formed against you shall prosper. God said it. Death doesn't have the victory. But Martha said, whoa, wait a minute now. Master, it's, he stinks. He's been there for four days. You know, I don't know what her apprehension was. I don't know if it was that she thought Jesus couldn't take the stink or if she couldn't take it. I know that as Christians, we often uh, react like that. We often find ourselves in the face of sin and we are too busy fanning our faces to be obedient to God. He said, your brother will rise again. But it's right here in this little passage that it gets very, very good. But for the benefit of those who don't believe. What am I saying? I said that this message was for the church of God, for the people of God. You see, when we gather in our sanctuaries, when we gather in our places of worship, when we gather for our rituals of communion, we need not think that everybody is there believing what we believe. My, my, my. Sometimes God got to show out yes. so that some folks can believe, but even then there are those. There are those who stand in bewilderment and confusion like Martha and say, but Lord, uh, I know you said you would do it, but do you know how ugly this will be while you're doing it? He knows. Just like he knew where Lazarus was buried and didn't need them to take him there, he wanted them to take him there. He knows. He knows how ugly your sin is and my sin is. He knows how bad we stink. But yet, he's there. And gathered around are uh, the people who will believe, the people who do believe, and the people who don't. So what's the warning? What's the more than? The more than is don't believe that everybody sitting in the pew with you is for you. Don't 
believe that everybody who comes is not just here to see what they can see and run and go tell that. Because if you read a little further down, you will find that some of the people who were gathered there went off and told the story and the plot began to thicken. They wasn't just going to kill Jesus. They were going to kill Lazarus too. So even your freedom is not welcomed by everybody. He says, roll the stone away. In this, we see, people of God, that we as the church have a responsibility not just to carry Jesus to the mess, but to illuminate it. What do we think has been happening in America? What do we think when AOC said they talked about me and this is what he said? What do we think when Black Lives Matters protested? What do we think was happening? See, somewhere, somebody picked up Jesus and carried it in and illuminated the situation. And now they're telling me they're talking about it around the world. What happened in London, in Paris, and in Germany, the world began to talk about the evil that was racism. You see, it is our responsibility as Christians not just to carry God, but to let his light shine. And if you say you walk in the light and you don't do what is right, you have lied. You do not have fellowship with him. Do you understand it? Good. I said I wouldn't be before you long. Praise God. The final directive to the church, to the people, to the gathered throng is to lose him and let him go. Now, we need to take a moment with this because there's a dual directive. There's a directive to the people and there is an implied directive to Lazarus. Lazarus has already been told to come, come out. And we know that the man got up, but the word tells us that though he got up, he was still bound about his feet and about his hands and that the linen death cloth draped his face. See, folks, we come to church. Wow. Sometimes because we drug to church. But one day, if we're lucky, we hear, bury the voice of Jesus and we answer. And we say, Lord, yes. And we get up. And we walk down and we give the pastor our hand and that's it. We've got salvation full and free. I'm ready to usher. I'm ready to trustee. I'm ready to finance. I'm ready to do everything except you're still stinky. Why are we still stinky? It's not just you, it's me. It's because even though we get up, there is another step that must be taken. Now Jesus implies in this passage that it is for the body to participate in. Jesus could have woke up the dead people all throughout Bethany if he hadn't called Lazarus by name. All power was there with him. But he was specific. And he said to the people, loose him. That means that when we welcome in people to the body of Christ and they've accepted Christ, we have a responsibility for their salvation. We have a responsibility to teach them and to reach them. We have a responsibility to take the chains off of their hands and off of their feet. Too often people come to God and the very first thing we do is bind them tighter in their sin. We don't want to let them be who God has created them to be. You do understand that that's the story of Lazarus. I mean, it's great that he was dead and that he was raised up, but he was raised up new. You see, when you die and God calls you, you're a new creation, Pastor. He's new. He is to live into what God has called him to be. And the people were just watching. Well, They just watched. It took Jesus saying, loose him. Let him go. Is there a situation in your life where you refuse to loose somebody? You won't let them overcome who you knew them 
to be. Perhaps they were an addict and they will always be an addict to you. Perhaps they uh, were a little loose in the street and they will always be a little loose to you. Perhaps they had a cussing spirit and you just waiting to be cussed out. Is there anybody who are you are just tightening up the death clothes for? We have a responsibility, church, to God and to one another to carry God into the mess, to shine God's light on the mess, and to be God's hands and feet in the freedom of his people. He's calling us. Truly, I say to you, unless he is born again, he cannot see the kingdom. So when he called Lazarus up and the shroud was still over his face, Lazarus was missing something critical. He could not look at Jesus. Barry, that's why I have to get with the old saints every now and again because they could sing it in such a way to make me understand it real good. Only a look at Jesus will turn you away from sin. See, I come to tell you, in case the people around you are not listening, will not loose you and let you be who God created you to be, you don't have to worry about that. Thanks be to God. Because you see, after he raised Lazarus from the dead, after Lazarus sat at dinner with him, after that, on a hill far away, Jesus was hung up and stretched wide and for our sins that death shroud he died and so if don't nobody else want to lose you on the third day morning they came to another tomb yes. and that stone was rolled away and in that tomb was the shroud of death just laying there so what am I saying church I'm saying that Jesus has given us the power to shake it off if you want to shake it off shake it off don't wait for bear don't wait for Reverend Danley. Shake it off. There's a Bible. There's a Bible study somewhere. If you aren't doing it, it's on you. But what you need to understand is that those of us who have begun to shake off the death clothes have a responsibility to those who are still bound. We have a responsibility to lift up the name of Jesus, to act like we can hear him, to act like we know how to obey him until we can actually do it. In the spiritual disciplines class, folks got all wrapped up in this question about service. Well, if I do anything for God, isn't it service? And it took me a few days to understand. See, when Lazarus got up, he was obeying God, but his ministry was limited. Huh? He could not use his hands to heal. He could not use his feet to walk from place to place to talk about what had happened to him. You see, it was just limited. So we can go about life being limited Christians, but that ain't what I'm here for. I'm here to press forward to the mark of the high calling, and I can't do that bound up. So, as the old folks would say, if you can't help me, don't stop me. Get out of my way and don't try to block me. Carry it with you, saints. We can't be at this altar together to sit together and to sup together and to remember what God has done for us together. But we are in fellowship and no devil on earth or in hell can stop that fellowship unless we allow it. We have a decision to make. It's no wonder the songwriter said, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. He heard the voice and it saved him. He was lost and now he was found, but it wasn't until he could see that he could finish the stanza. Not until we can see. Will you taste and see with me the glory of the man we call Jesus? Will you carry him? Will you shine 
that light because there is a world out there that will not know salvation until the people of God act like the people of God. Barry, come play something. Amen and amen. singing that it was something happened and now I know church I don't know where you find yourself today you may indeed find yourself locked in a cave that is dark, that is lonely, isolated. And it may feel as if the world has positioned a boulder over the entrance and no light can come in. Oh, but believe me, we serve a God who knows your name and he's calling you by your name whether you accepted him 60 years ago or you've never heard his voice before I implore you to listen God is calling today so if it is that you need a touch from God. If it is that there is something in your life that needs to be removed, something that needs to be changed, something that needs to be rearranged, it is available in Jesus. All you have to do is acknowledge Him. He has already acknowledged you. You can call the church, you can email the church, but you don't have to walk alone. That's what we stand for. You don't have to do it alone. So if you're in need of a friend, let me just recommend Jesus. He is that kind of Someone's heart has been moved. Someone is crying right now. Someone is feeling laughter in their soul. And all of those 
are good indications that the Spirit has touched you. And we're so glad. But as the preacher, our lay leader, Miss Kimberly Young has proclaimed today, if you are bound, we are here to loose you and set you free. That's our job, church. And so wherever you are today, wherever you are, call on the name of Jesus. And once you've done that, connect yourself with the church somewhere, somehow, via telephone, via text, via internet, and let them know that you have received salvation, but you don't want to walk this walk alone. That you need some believers to walk beside you. So we pray that the God who never fails has met you where you are today. And we thank you for participating today in the discipline of worship. We thank you for praying for us and praying with us. We thank you for your remarks on Twitter and on Facebook. We are grateful for those who are on Zoom. And we say to you, to you, and yes, even you, may the love of God always surround you. May the peace of God always envelop you. And may the love of God always prop you up, as the old folk would say, on every leaning side. Until we meet again, to him who is the glory, the majesty, and the power, to him be all, all of our worship, all of our praise, all that we have. And the people of God can say with me, amen, and amen, and amen. God bless you, Robert Stamler. See you next week.